We are, um, today is January 10th, 2011. We are at the Peabody Public Library in Columbia City interviewing Lynn A. Klingeman. Uh, the interviewer is Janet Skang, director of the library. Mr. Klingeman, uh, what branch of the service did you serve in? The Army. And what war was that? That was during the Korean conflict. And what was your highest rank? Corporal. Corporal. Where did you serve? I took basic training at Fort Minor Road, Missouri. I transferred to Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland. And I took welding school at Maryland. I stayed there about 18 months as welding instructor on vertical overhead welding. Then I was shipped overseas to Europe and I traveled to Verdun, France was my home base and I went to school in a wheel vehicle school in Fusen, Germany for approximately 100 days and then back to Verdun. And then when I got down to had about 22 days left I think I was shipped back home. So. Okay. Um, says you joined the army in, in October of 1952. What were you doing then? I was you were farming. You were I, farming. Yeah, I here in this area. I, I graduated from high school at Laurel, and uh, I started farming with my folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had uh, at that point in time, I had a deferment because we were farming fairly heavily and I had a one year deferment then I went and reapplied and got another deferment then when I went back in 52 to get the third deferment they told me that they never gave the third deferment so that meant that you were right in the front of the draft list because at that point in time it was drafting people and so I made up my mind I wasn't going to be drafted. So I checked in at Fort Wayne and found out what I could and couldn't do and at the recruiting office. And I signed up for welding school and wheel vehicle school because you had to have two schoolings at the same post. Well then, almost immediately, he was sent to Indianapolis because it already joined and took your physical exam and so on and, and then after you passed your physical exam well, you was loaded up on a bus and went to Fort Custer, Michigan and processed there for a couple days then I was shipped to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for basic training. And What was that like, basic training? Well, this may be strange sounding to you. But when I went in the military, I weighed about 135 pounds. I was used to eating heavy and heavy work. And as far as I'm concerned, basic training was a snap. And I... How long did that last basic training? That was eight weeks. Eight weeks. And I, it took me longer than that because I was in there in the late fall and I contacted pneumonia and I had to go to the hospital for about a week and that put you out of rotation so I ended up went in with a different company then and finished basic but I always tell people this but basic was so tough that I gained 35 pounds in basic training but I was used to heavy work you know and guys complained about 40 pound packs well, I was used to carrying a 100-pound bag of feed on my shoulder. What and kind of farm were you? What kind of farming was it? Just general farming. General farming. Yeah, up here. My dad owned a farm near the south end of New Lake, oh. here in Whitley County. Okay. So, um, I don't think we can say you enjoyed basic, but it wasn't quite as tough as, no, I wonder, you as it was on others. It wasn't nearly as tough as I thought it would be, you know. And what kind of things did they have you do in basic training? Well, first off, 
the first thing that you do is wake up, pay attention, and do what you're told, and you got to learn to march. Because I, you know, farm boy, I never marched at nothing, you know. And so you heard this saying many times, hey farm boy, pick your feet up and march, you're not stepping over the cow turds. And I heard that many times, you know, not only myself, but other people too, you know. What, but, kind of, what kind of, what were the guys like when you, going through basic your, um, your company? With, I think you said they were farmers? They were farm boys, city boys, all mixed up. All mixed up. Were yeah. they from Indiana or how did they do that? Well, uh, they was everywhere. From everywhere? Yeah, by the time you got to Fort Leonard Wood, it was a complete mix. Okay. And it, one thing I do remember that it was late in the fall and when we went through infiltration course, which was a one day deal that you learn how to respond to and crawl on the ground under live machine gun fire. Well, it was muddy and sloppy and it was cold. And I wore long johns and throughout the rest of my military career, you could still pick out that pair of long johns because you had red Missouri mud stains on the front of your legs and on the back of your legs because you had to crawl in your belly part of the time and part of the time you wiggle on your back and you just them underwear had been washed many times but you could still pick them out from the red Missouri mud. And I never forgot that but, but that was one of the things that's kinda of stuck in your mind. Anything else from, from your basic training that stands out in your mind? Well the one big thing that I stood out in my mind when we Two things. When we took, we had lots of rifle training, of course, and then when you had machine gun training, for some reason I was picked. You have a machine gunner and a assistant for handling the ammo, and you laid down that parallel to a machine gun. I'd never heard one fired before. And so he was laying there with him from here to the gun barrel and then he ripped off about a hundred rounds. That's kind of noisy and kind of startled you, you know. Mm -hmm. and then when you, you took turns on this, but you fired the machine gun at targets and then you, they put you out in a concrete tile in, a, in the ground that was vertical, and you held up targets, and somebody else would machine gun the target, and so live ammo was going over your head, two feet over your head, and you would count the hits, and then you'd radio back and tell them how many hits they had, and that was kind of different. Say so. But that's one of the things that kind of stuck in your mind, you know. And then you went to Aberdeen Proving Grounds? Yes. Okay, where's that at? Uh, that's at Aberdeen, Maryland. Aberdeen, Maryland. And uh, I was transferred there to explain how I come to transfer to there. When I joined the military, I signed up for welding school and or wheel vehicle school. Well, I did not get my paperwork back before I went to the military. So my folks got my paperwork. I was about four weeks into basic and the folks sent me my paperwork that I was accepted at Aberdeen, Maryland. And I took them to my first sergeant and he looked at them and just kind of a, yeah, you might as well use that for toilet paper. And, but I kept them. And so on the sixth week of basic training, you went to a schooling interview, and I took my paperwork and handed it to 
guy was interviewing me. He looks at it, never said a word, got up, and next thing I was talking to the sergeant, and he sat there and read him, and he went and got a first lieutenant, and this lieutenant come back and read my paperwork, and said, well, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm where everybody sent me. You know, you don't have no choice. So at the end of my basic training, I went all by myself, by train from Fort Edward, Missouri to Aberdeen, Maryland. And I stayed there. I was in a receiving company for about two weeks till you come into cycle with your schooling. Mm -hmm. And then I went to 12 weeks of welding school. And I graduated tops in my class. And in the 10th week of welding school, they asked me if I wanted to stay as a welding instructor on Verde Cone overhead welding. Well, at that time, they were still fighting like mad in Korea, and had I said no, you'd have been on the next boat to Korea. So I thought about it for about two seconds, and well, yeah, I'll stay. And so I stayed there for the next 18 months. And, and it was, that part of it was almost like a job, except on Saturdays and Sundays you had some training on Saturdays mm -hmm. uh, because the schooling was five days a week and then Saturday they done other military things. But during that course of time, being as I was welding instructor, I was sent to movie projection school because you used movies in the course of teaching Oh, okay. students to some classroom work. Mm -hmm. Then I went to, and I enjoyed that because you used a, what they called jam projectors or joint Army Navy 16 millimeter projectors and then they trained you on that and also on 35 millimeter so I actually ran the 35 millimeter movie projection of a base movie. Ah. And I substituted on that, but I got to do that several times. And then I went to, I was sent to Fort Meade, Maryland, and I went to two weeks of chemical, biological, and radiological warfare school because each company had to have a CBR man. And I, for some reason I was picked to go. You never know the reason, you know, just you go, you know. And, so, what was that all about? What did you learn there? Well, that was almost beyond your mental capacity because they delved into atomic warfare, chemical warfare, and you know radiological warfare, mm -hmm. and so you viewed the actual War Department films of testing at White Sands, New Mexico. You viewed the actual bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. As, it, as these were official War Department films. Then you viewed the testing at Bikini Atoll in the Pacific Ocean after the war was over. And then chemical and biological warfare. Chemical warfare, they taught you how to detect certain chemical gases and what to do to protect yourself. And you ended up training or setting up tents and trained other people how to protect yourself, you know. And that was kind of hilarious in a way. I mean, it was quite serious, but it was hilarious because they would, you would tell a person to walk into this tent, which had tear gas. Well, you can't breathe that very long. So you walk in there with your mask off. You put your mask on and exhale to clear the mask. Well, some guys wouldn't get this done, and so they go coughing and hacking, running out the tent. Well, then their next go around was chlorine gas, and you'll pass out from that some people still didn't know how to clear their mask, so you'd leave them in there 
till they fell over, and then you'd grab them and drag them outdoors so they could get some fresh air and get conscious again, you know, because you just pass out from them. And the biological warfare, they delved into that some, and that, I remember one thing that they was telling me about, you know, in World War I, they used quite a lot of mustard gas. And at this point in time, mustard gas was supposedly illegal, but they could use phosgene and chlorpicrin and G-series gases and so on. And they come around, had some mock thing that they put a spot on the back of your hand and told you it was such and such a gas, well, or, and it wasn't, you know, but it would make a big red spot on your back of your hand. And some guys would about pass out when they did that. Well, you just sit there and look at it, you know, and it didn't hurt or anything, you know. But that's what that was about. But each each company had to have a CBR man. And then we do, was it your responsibility then to make, I'm not quite sure, they sent you for this training, but what did they expect you to do with it? Well, when you come back, it was required, when you come back to your home company, each company was required to have somebody that was qualified as a chemical, biological, and radiological warfare person to be somewhat of a leader in case that mm. you had, was exposed to that at some point in time. Okay, so would it be your responsibility then if something, you know, if there was a um, atomic or biological <clears throat> threat it would have been your responsibility to make sure the guys did what they had to do. To yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just want to understand what's going on. Okay. What else happened over there at Aberdeen? Well, I made a few trips home because I was dating a young woman down here in Washington Township, and stay came. And my folks and my girlfriend came out to Aberdeen one time and visited. But I think I made, I think 13 round trips. You were there how um, many months? I was there 18 months. Oh, once a month. And uh, you would get off work on Friday night at about 5 o'clock. Well, it would be about 6 before you could leave. Well, it took you 13 hours to drive and to get home. So I'd get here about 8.30 in the morning, drove all night. and. To go to the folks and visit them and go down and pick up my girlfriend. And we didn't stay out very late on Saturday night and go to church on Sunday at Washington Center Church. And then you had to leave by no later than 2 o'clock in the afternoon in order to be back in time for Reveille. So you was about dead from the lack of sleep by the time you got back. So everybody was doing it. And so it was about Wednesday morning before you become civilized again. <laughs> well, you look, oh, fortunately, you were able to do that. Um, must have had a good car. No. No. I had a old Plymouth car, and I blew it up once. Coming home, I got down here to the schoolhouse on nine down here south of town. Mm -hmm. I got there and it was knocking so bad that I, I better shut this thing off. And I was on Saturday forenoon and my dad had used it in the garage up there quite a bit so dad come down and drug me home with his car and we immediately got a hold of Grover Gardy and he got a hold of Schrader's here in Columbia City and they come out and grounded one throw on the crankshaft and put it back together, and I had the car running for a date that evening. And so I drove it back the next day then. You don't get service like that nowadays, do you? No, <laughs> but Grover was a local mechanic, you know, and he knew me well, and, and he said, well, we gotta get you going. So they did. So you got back in time. Yeah. Okay, anything else about Aberdeen? Well, I think that I'd done some traveling For weekends, I traveled numerous times to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And 
I've walked up the Washington Monument, I've been to the Lincoln Monument, and I spent many hours in the, in the, the uh, I can't say the name of them now, the museum there, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, Smithsonian? Yeah, the Smithsonian Institute. I spent many hours in there. But something, uh, I had a cousin that was a young woman that lived here in Whitley County and she'd gotten a job out there. So we would stay overnight at her house and just go down to Smithsonian mm -hmm. Institute and look around and do whatever and then go back to camp that evening, you know, it was about 70 miles back to camp and so that's what we've done mostly for recreation. They tell me that the food in the military is not that good. How'd you do? Well, the food in the military, you kind of got used to it. And being tasty was not necessarily a criteria. That's putting it mildly. <laughs> and I go back to my first military meal I had was in Fort Custer, Michigan. And we had left Indianapolis and went to Fort Custer and about arrived there about two o'clock in the morning. We had to, had no supper. And my first meal was supposedly eggs in a pan about that long, about this wide. It was just a green slop. And you had a pint of milk and something that was supposed to resemble sausage and gravy. And I never forgot that because they, the eggs looked terrible. I mean, eye appeal was not anything to... Taste and eye appeal, they didn't care about They didn't care about that. And the other thing, uh, well, you had sea rations on occasion during... Oh, who knows? Well, them were individual containers of food that was for an individual person. And this would consist of some type of meat in a little canister and you would have some crackers and cookies and, and maybe a small chocolate bar and at that time they were still passing out cigarettes and I never smoked so I just gave them away to somebody else. And then K rations was basically the same thing except that that was common gallon cans and that was prepared by the cooks, you know, and, but it was basically And you had time. those while you were actually stationed in um, Aberdeen? And yeah, you had them once a month. Okay. Yeah. Now the kitchen at Aberdeen was a modern, up-to-date kitchen, a mess hall, and it would be similar to, like going to Remember when Ponderosa Steakhouse was here in Columbia City? Be similar, you know, it was cafeteria style, mm -hmm. of course, but they moved you through there quite rapidly. And you got stuck on KP duty once a month, and that could be preparing food or could be just cleaning and washing or whatever. I got stuck one time in making cherry pies. And Actually making them. Yeah, he made them cherry pies, and I, I, the reason I remember that, my mom always made big fat cherry pies. Mm -hmm. Well, I started making them that way, and the mess hall sergeant come around, what in the world's the matter with you? <laughs> Scrape them off level. Well, then when they was cooked, you know, you just had a little piece of pie about that thick, you know, and I never forgot that, you know, <laughs> he didn't like my fat pies. And I made toast a number of times that they had a machine that you could put three slices of bread on at a time and it went on a chain around here and it dumped it out and you painted you painted the toast with melted butter with just a paintbrush. And but I made toast several times, you know. Well that's your job today is make toast. Okay. But, um after um, Aberdeen then, what happened? Uh, when I got orders 
at the time I was in, if you got down to 12 months of time left, you normally did not get shipped overseas. Well, I got down to 13 months left, and they posted your orders on the How long ball. had you signed up for? Three what? years. For three years, okay. Three years. And so, somebody come back in the barracks one day, hey, Klingerman, you're on a bolt board out here. And so, he was posted on a bolt board, so he had to go to the company officer, and they gave you orders, and I was, I took a, about a three-week leave, and came home, and then I had to report to Newark, New Jersey, for overseas shipment. But then my wife and I, or my girlfriend and I at that time, had talked about possibly getting married because a dependent could go overseas, see, uh, possibly, not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So we decided to go ahead and get married. So one week into my three week leave, we got married. And took a short honeymoon up through Michigan and across Lake Michigan, back down through Wisconsin and back home. And at the end of the two weeks, well, you had to leave, you know, to go to Newark, New Jersey. And at that point, it was a, there was hundreds of guys going over to Europe. And you processed there for a day or two, then boarded ship on troop ship. And I got to explain this a little bit. Anybody that's ever been on a troop ship knows what I'm talking about. Somebody that has never been on one can't understand it. A room this size, you could have 25 guys living in this room. Bunks close enough together that if you raise your knees up, somebody will get your knees out of my back. Or if you flop your arm off, whoa, what are you trying to do, be gay or something? And it was very close quarters. And there was about 4,400 guys aboard a ship, 550 feet long. And so it was quite close. But you survived it. And we, one thing I do remember about that, I don't remember the name of the ship anymore. But we, they put out a ship's newspaper and we traveled at 16 knots an hour, burnt 1,100 gallons of fuel an hour, and it took us 10 days from Newark, New Jersey to Bremerhaven, Germany. And during that course of time, when we first left port at Newark, New Jersey, we were at sea about a day or day and a half and run into that Hurricane Hazel that done so much damage in the early 50s on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And that was an experience because you had these rooms had a ventilator that big around and the ship was going up and down and the prop would break water and just tremble like mad when it broke water. But you had, actually had water come down these oh. vents and you had four to six inches of water slopping around in this mm -hmm. Room and and uh, guys get sick and throw up and so on. So it wasn't very pleasant. Stunk like mad, you know. How long did that last? The About two days. Two days. Yeah. Two days. And it was after the hurricane was over. You had great big swells, and it was kind of fun to walk up to the front of the ship, and you would go down and down and down and down. And you see this big wave coming or swell, and then you'd go up and up and up and up and up. Uh, it seemed like you went up 25, 30 feet, you know. And so I done that a couple times, you know, mm -hmm. just something different to do. But I went to Bremerhaven, Germany, and we traveled by train to Nancy, France, and that was the closest train station to Verdun and you rode in a compartment with six people or six GIs and your knees touched the other's 
faced each other and your knees about touched each other on this little dinky compartment. You had six guys, six duffel bags, and six handbags. Oh. And so most of the time you had your legs stressed out with your duffel bag laying down here and, and your handbag on your lap, you know, and we traveled. Part of, I traveled part of one afternoon and part of a night getting to, we're done, or Nancy, because the towns were old towns. So the trains went past the town and then backed in on a siding. Well, we were, we were not on, I don't know what the proper word would be, but we were not on a through train. So you may have done a lot of times you have to back in and get out of the way of whatever else was coming on the rail line. And then you pull back out and go some more. And, and uh, <coughs> when I got to Nancy, France, you had to I had to go to the bathroom. And of course I'd never been to France before. And so the train station there, the other guys was going in this room here and you couldn't read, you know, I don't know what French word for man was at that time. So they walked in this room. Here was a bare concrete room, had holes about 12 inches across. That was over a sewer. No dividing walls, no nothing. And you had to go do whatever you needed to do over one of these holes. And that was it. And they did not have toilet paper. And they had a, I'll call it a fountain type thing there that you could go wet some paper or your handkerchief or something, wipe yourself, and that was it. And then we traveled by bus to Verdun. And I was at Verdun, got there. at night and we turned in all of our clothing because we had been going for two weeks or better out of our duffel bag and we were told to turn in our clothes. So the very next morning we had Reveille and the sergeant in charge there says, well we got the guy was supposed to go to wheel vehicle school and he's in the hospital. Who wants to go? I said, I'll go. So I ended up, I got both schoolings that I signed up for. So I went immediately to Fusen, Germany to wheel vehicle school. What, what is that wheel vehicle school? All right, that was the repair of engines, transmissions, and drivetrain of anything that had okay. rubber tires on. Just like uh, a mechanic. Type yeah, it's like a mechanic school. And that was roughly 100 days long. And so... And southern Germany, or Fusen Germany, is in the Bavarian Alps. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful country. And we had nice barracks there. The weather was about like you would have here this time of year. And I was there in the wintertime. And so I went to that wheel vehicle school and done very well in that. And on Christmas Day, of 1954. Our barracks was on flat ground. And then you had this first ridge that had ski jumps on it because the Germans were quite active on skiing and so on and ice skating and so on. Then the second ridge was much higher. And on Christmas Day of 54, we went over the first ridge, climbed the second ridge, and I was in Austria about 15 feet because we came across one of these square stone monuments that said Deutschland, Austria. So I walked over into Austria, I suppose illegally. And he was up in the mountains, you don't know anybody there. But, and then at Fusen, Germany, was New Schwanstein Castle, was built by King Ludwig. And, 
1870s, and that was within walking distance. And I went to that two different times, and uh, I think one experience that I had. This was during the Cold War, mm -hmm. and you had alerts at various times because you did not know what the Russians was going to do, and we had an alert that on weekends you'd had people picked out that would be charging quarters when the commander was gone, you know, and if anything come up we had to call him. Well I had to be charged of quarters one weekend and they called in there and this is a word and he had to call a company commander and he had to call the MPs and, and the MPs went off post and gathered up the guys that was off post, you know, what they could find and in less than an hour the post was deserted except that I was left behind because they, you had to have somebody there and I had to go around and check to make sure that nobody was in the barracks and so on. And that's kind of eerie when you're there all by yourself, you know. Why, why did they take, I'm, I'm confused, they, um, they, 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 alert, they sent out an alert and the alert meant take people off the base? Well, that, what that meant was, or what it could mean, this was of course a practice alert. Mm -hmm. But if the Russians, at that time, and the Russians done this a number of times, would come rushing up to the border within 10 miles of the border and stop. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't know whether they was going to come on or not. And so they called these alerts. And the military personnel, you got all your trucks and your equipment and everything and dispersed, left. Uh, you had other places to go. Okay. And it's like regrouping somewhere else. Yeah, they regrouped somewhere else. Okay. And I don't know where they regrouped because I was left behind. Okay. So I suppose in a case of, I've thought about this, I suppose in a case of the Russians did come, you'd have been sacrificed. Yeah. You know, but it weighed on your mind a little bit, you know, but, but you didn't think about it too much. You just done what you're mm -hmm. supposed to do and left it go at that. But then after I left Fusion, Germany, I returned back to Verdun, France. <coughs> and I worked in a fourth and fifth echelon maintenance repair shop that repaired all kinds of vehicles. And I was a welder, so you got involved with some body work broken frames, bent frames, and, and cranes, and I told people I welded anything from cookie cutters to cranes, and it was pretty much like a, a job. Mm -hmm. uh, and I took leave. I run around with a guy from Idaho, and we became friends, and we took leave before we had to come home and we went through Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, to Copenhagen, Denmark, to Sweden and back to Copenhagen and down back to Frankfurt, Germany and Heidelberg and then back to Verdun. But Did you drive that or? We went by rail yeah. and we didn't have no car. And we was about dead by the time we got that done because we'd done most of our traveling at night so that you could be a point of interest the next mm -hmm. morning, you know, and so on. But on this leave, we went to Frankfurt when we was coming back, and we hired a taxi driver to take us someplace so we could sleep. Well, he drove up the street, down the street, here and there. He had no idea where he was going. He drove for about 30 minutes. The next morning we woke up and he could hear trains. And we wasn't three blocks from a train station. So we kind of got took on that. But we went back to Verdun. I wanted to say something about Verdun here. And that was pretty interesting. Verdun 
was never captured by the Germans in World War I. Mm -hmm. And there was a series of forts around Verdun, and for the lack of something to do, you could rent a bicycle and you could ride out to these various forts. So I visited several of them forts, and the during World War I, when they had the Battle of Verdun, was over about a 10-month period, and the two armies, the German and the French, lost about 80,000 troops apiece on a 10-mile front in a 10-month period, and they just kind of gave up and dissipated. But this Fort Dumont that we visited had been the scene of some pretty heavy fighting, and it was up, this ground was big rolling hills, and this fort was on top of the hill, most of it was under the ground. And the Germans had captured part of that for about two days, and then they were driven back out. But the ground around this fort had received enough bombardment that you had the equivalent of about one and a half artillery shells fell for every square foot of soil. And it looked like it. And it was a national park then for mm -hmm. France, just like they had a cemetery there and so on. They did have a cemetery. Yeah, they had a cemetery there. And one thing I wanted to bring out to the... On Memorial Day of 1955, I went on a bus thing to a Muse Argonne American Military Cemetery. And that, I think, was one of the most sobering things that I ever attended in my entire life. They had a very good military chaplain speaker, and you could sit right there and look out here, and there was 14,000 American crosses out here of American dead from World War II. And that was pretty sobering. And I never ever forgot that. And it's a... Uh... But anyhow, in due course of time, well, we got orders to come back to the States and back by troop ship, and this was in early October, and we took the northern route, and for some reason, they didn't allow you to take your overcoat. And I, you had to huddle on, the, if you was out on deck on the ship, you had to huddle up here in a corner someplace in the sunshine, because it was cold, and you didn't have no Did overcoat. Did you give reason for that? No, they just leave you. Can't take your overcoats, so you didn't. The you talk about this word reason in our shop overseas when Verdun they had a big sign hanging up there. No damned reason, just our policy. <laughs> and that's when you said reason, you know, that made me think of that. Okay. But anyhow, we come back. And as we got close to New York City, it's a wonder the boat didn't sink on the front because I think everybody available was standing on the front of the boat to see the Statue of Liberty. And I can't express to you how nice that looked. And that's the only time I ever got to see the Statue of Liberty, but that meant she was back home. And we disembarked the ship, and part of the guys, we were to go to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, to be mustered out of the army, and part of us, part of the guys went by train, and part of us went by plane. Well, I was on the group that went by plane, and we boarded a military contract carrier. Sixty-six of us aboard, and there was, we got on the plane, and four engines, prop driven, and one engine wouldn't start. 
So they took us back off. Due course of time, they put us back on. All engines started, but the one that wouldn't start before caught fire. So they took us back off and put us up in a hotel for about four hours and come back out and put us on the same airplane. And I was getting about ready to, hey, I'll just pay my way back. But anyhow, we flew back to Midway Airport in Chicago and bus to Fort Sheridan. And we was there a couple days and mustered out. And I and three other guys hired a taxi to take us to the train station and bought tickets to come to, I bought tickets for Fort Wayne. I had no idea who the other three guys was. It just, all right, four of us can fit in a taxi. So we split the cost and done that. But I remember I hadn't seen my parents or my wife for a whole year. And that really looked nice coming down Warsaw, Pearson, Larval, Columbia City, and then Fort Wayne. And I don't think my wife ever did forgive me about this, but I got out of the train station at Fort Wayne and she worked at Lincoln Life. <coughs> and I was supposed to be there roughly such and such a time. She knew approximately when I'd be there. Well, as I was walking down the street from the train station to Lincoln Life, firemen were making a scale on a building, you know, or rappelling down the side of the building. So I stopped and watched them for about 15 minutes because the first thing, I was nervous, you know. And so I stopped here 15, 20 minutes and watched them and walked on down to Lincoln Life and met my wife. And, and uh, she took the rest of the afternoon off from work and, and uh, went home. And she had moved some of her stuff. My dad owned a farm just south of Etna and the house was not occupied. It was an old farmhouse. And I made up my mind that when we got home, I was not staying with my parents or her parents. And so we started, we'd been married a year, but we started our married life on October 12th of 1955 with a card table, two folding chairs. It's in October, and we bought some milk and some cereal and so on. We put the milk in a bucket of water, set it out on the porch to keep it cool, and that's what we started married life with. And I had some money from muster out pay, so in the next few days we bought one of them steel kitchen tables and chairs and mm -hmm. bought a few other things. We bought a refrigerator, and that's what we started with. And a wood stove, when Dad had a wood stove we put in the house and so on. <coughs> But that pretty much tells my story. I think. What, what, after you were mustered out and you were back here, what did you do? I mean, well, I went back to farming. You went back to farming? Yeah, I went back to farming with my dad. And in due course of time, we farmed once again fairly heavily for that time span. Kind of light by today's standards, but at that time we was farming fairly heavily. And we had livestock and grain farm and, and uh, eventually we got rid of the livestock and then eventually I split up with my dad because he got old and cranky to the point I couldn't do anything right and so we split but I continued to mm -hmm. farm and I farmed his farm and my farm mm -hmm. and uh, then I had, I utilized my experience in the military because I've done welding nearly all my entire life and some mechanic work and so on. And so my feeling was I got what I asked for mm -hmm. in the military. Even though I signed up for the three years, I can't complain. And it was a, it got you away from home, not that I wanted to leave, mm -hmm. but it got you away from home, seen some rest of the world, and seeing how other people operated and so on instead of just being a Clinton County resident, you know. Mm -hmm. And 
So we, we still live in the same location we did in 1955. And our house burned in 1966 and we built a new house on the same location. And we're still there. And I've been married 56 years now. So you used you used what you learned in the military? I used uh, very heavily what mm -hmm. I learned in the military. No, you, you, and, you, and you stuck strictly to farming. You didn't go out and get a job like a I did. I had... I was self-employed farming mm -hmm. and I done welding okay. and some me mechanic work as a sideline, okay. especially after we got rid of animals. Mm -hmm. And you had time, you know, that you could do this. And I sold grain bins and done millwright work and I built quite a bit of stuff down here for Gene Byers on Vine Street and out here east of town on the grain bin sites. Mm -hmm. we, we put up, I think, three large bins out there and a couple of elevator legs. I'd done that for, and then in 1988, I'd done quite a bit of work up here. The Calvagra at Waterloo was a large grain terminal, and I was asked to come up there as maintenance manager. And I worked there for five years, just a little over five years as maintenance manager, and then got laid off, and I come back and worked at staff go out here east of town or west of town as a welder and I worked there nine weeks and I hated the way they'd done things and so I quit mm -hmm. and I went down and I had rebuilt an engine for Wally Simmons and I had that in the pickup that day so I left there about 9.30 in the morning staff go took that engine down there and set it off and Wally's wife was there and I said, Wally wasn't, I said, I give him the bill and I said, well, I've done something I never did before. I quit a job. Oh, you're out of work now? I said, yeah, about 30 minutes ago I was out of work. Well, I left and went home and by the time I got home, I had a phone call from Wally, that if you want a job, come down. So I turned right around, I went right back down to work that afternoon, and his pay was a dollar an hour better than staff go. Yeah. And I worked there that afternoon, and I went there the next morning, and they said, I'll raise you two bucks. So that made me three dollars an hour more than what I was getting at staff go. And it was a variety of work rather than just one thing, you know. And I. I've always liked variety to some extent. So, how about some of those people you served with? You keep in touch with them now? I kept in touch with uh, Edwin Elkins in Montana, and when I was at Aberdeen, we ran around together some, mm -hmm. and I I got out of the military in '55 and '58. I went out to see Elkins in Montana, mm -hmm. and he was, we sent him a letter that we was going to be there at such and such a time. Well, he lived the third house out of town, seven and a half miles. Well, in our time span, he'd went somewhere, and he didn't get our letter. So we went there, and no Elkins. And so we went on our rest of our trip. We went to Yellowstone and back around and come back across Wyoming and went back up to see him and stayed there a couple days. And uh, he lived on a ranch there that he owned. And this ranch was large enough. I don't know how many acres he had, but we went deer hunting the first night there, which is illegal at night, and he says, I said something about it, he said, hey, if the game warden even hears my rifle shot, he's trespassing. <laughs> and I never forgot him telling me. But anyhow, over the next several years, I lost track of it. And he moved to the north, the west side, up where Glacier National Park is. And 
I was aware of that. We never visited him there. And then after that, he moved somewhere else, and I lost track of it. And then I, the guy that I went on leave with in Europe lived in Idaho, and we visited him at the same time. Mm -hmm. And he was a very good body man on body work for vehicles. And when we was overseas in Europe, he was dating a girl. And then he found out through one of his buddies that she was dating somebody else while he was gone. And he was all shook up about that. Well, he only had about eight or ten weeks to go till he's out of the military. And, I said, and we talked about this quite a bit. And I said, hey, there ain't nothing you can do about this 3,000 miles away. Play it cool. Be friendly. Don't cross any, don't knock any bridges out till you get home. Then you can see what's going on. Well, he done that. And in due course of time, I got a letter from him that he was engaged. And then we got a, I didn't go to his wedding, but in due course of time, I got a wedding announcement. Later on, I got a birth announcement, you know, and so on. And we've kept, I think this year is probably the first year we never exchanged Christmas cards. And for some reason, I don't know whether he's passed away or what, but I always felt good about that because he went ahead and married a girl that he was all shook up about, you know. So, Before we enter in the interview, is there anything else that you want to say? The only other thing I want to say, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, good old USA. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Appreciate that. Yes, we have faults here in the United States. We may not agree politically, but it's still the best place I've ever been. Those are very good sentiments. Mr. Queen, we want to thank you, then. thank you for your time today and telling us your story, and thank you for your service. Okay.